All right, this is disturbing last found footage of missing persons. Sophia McKenna. On the night of May 27th, 2018, 20-year-old Spencer Mugford met up with his friend Sophia McKenna in the parking lot of the University of Connecticut Avery Point, where Spencer was a student. Okay. At the time, Sophia was in a toxic and abusive relationship with a guy named Austin Cordova, which had gotten worse in the months leading up to that night in May. According to Sophia's mom, Austin was seeing someone else while he was still dating Sophia, after which Sophia also decided to date other guys. When Austin found out, he went to Sophia's apartment and tried to kick down the door, allegedly Holy threatening shit. to end her life. It was after this incident that Sophia started to spend a lot of her time- How the f is he gonna be cheating on her, but then when she cheats on him, he gets mad? Dude, people are so stupid, man. ...time around Spencer Mugford, whom she had met while working at a local spa. They dated for a while, but it didn't take long before they decided to go back to just being friends. A couple of weeks later, okay. Spencer took on another job on a charter boat, taking people out on the water for half-day fishing trips. That night in May, Spencer and Sophia met at the parking lot and got in a massless sailboat they took from the university campus and headed toward the New London Ledge oh Lighthouse, God. a popular tourist attraction in Connecticut that's known as one of the creepiest buildings in the state. A little after one- That's a building in the middle of the ocean? a.m. action in Connecticut University campus and headed toward the new London Ledge Lighthouse, a popular tourist attraction in Connecticut. London Ledge Lighthouse. Wow, the, okay, literally in the middle of the water. Ooh, centering around the supposed spirit of a former keeper named Ernie. I mean, it looks kind of, it looks eerie. Just this thing in the middle of the water. Okay, okay, okay. Right. And a kid that's known as one of the creepiest buildings in the state. A little after 1 a.m., Sophia used Spencer's phone to upload a video to his Snapchat story, where he can okay. be seen paddling on the water aboard the tiny, massless sailboat. Yo, we're out here in the ocean. <laughs> with a... <laughs> that is the land. Like, we, we still There's have There's going to be a ghost in this video. Look at the quality. There? Wait, where? Oh, we're almost there. In the video, Sophia points the phone to the shore and jokingly emphasizes how long they still have left to get to the lighthouse, and the two friends seem in pretty good spirits as they travel toward the lighthouse. A few minutes later, at around 2 a.m., after finally arriving at the New London Ledge Lighthouse, Spencer posted a picture of Sophia in front of a no trespassing sign to his Snapchat. That was the last time either of them was ever seen again. The next day, Austin reached out to Sophia's mother, Michelle, Whoa. and said that he was worried because he hadn't heard from her, though they had plans to go shopping. That's when Michelle realized she had a bunch of missed calls from an unknown number from 2.05 a.m. to 2.09 a.m. the previous evening. And when she called the unknown number back, she realized it was Spencer's cell phone. Fearing the worst, Michelle reported her daughter missing, and at Holy around shit. 6 p.m. that same day, the Coast Guard launched an official search, during which they found Sophia's car parked at the Yukon parking lot with her phone still inside, which would explain why she used Spencer's phone to call her mother the evening prior. The Coast Guard also found Spencer's shirt tied to a boat cleat on the dock of the New London Ledge Lighthouse, which meant that he had probably used his shirt to dock the sailboat, except the sailboat was no longer there. While all of this was happening, Austin and his dad decided to start their own private search for Sophia and Spencer, and as they were flying over the water, they spotted the Yukon sailboat flipped upside down near Truman's oh, Beach on the north wow. shore of Long Island, around 13 miles from the lighthouse. Strangely, they found a series of unidentified fingerprints on the sailboat, which were never analyzed. On May 28th, just one day after the disappearance, the Coast Guard suspended the search due to the harsh weather, with plans to relaunch the search if they found or heard anything new that could help them track down the missing two. On June 8th, 11 days after the disappearance, Spencer's body was found floating in the ocean by a fisherman, pretty much in the opposite direction from the sailboat that Austin and his father wow, had found a few days earlier. Both alcohol and THC were found in Spencer's system. Even though the official cause of death was labeled as accidental drowning with no signs of human-induced trauma, it didn't take long for people to start coming up with some dark theories as to why Spencer had drowned while Sophia's body hadn't been found. On July 22, 2018, the Facebook group Finding Sophia McKenna was formed, where people came together to try to piece the puzzle of Sophia's disappearance. Although the cause of Spencer's death was pretty clear, it seems strange to a lot of people that the search had been called off so quickly, and that Spencer's phone records were never released. It also seemed a little suspicious that the fingerprints on the sailboat hadn't been analyzed, and that Sophia hadn't called 911 on the night of the disappearance, even though she clearly needed help. 
The heap of unanswered questions made a lot of people point fingers at Austin, alleging that he had somehow murdered Spencer and later took Sophia to another location before murdering her as well. As of August 2024, there isn't much evidence to support this theory, and even Sophia's mother claims she never believed Austin was responsible despite their troubled relationship. Based on the information that surfaced during the investigation, it's very likely that the sailboat became untied and started floating away at some point in the night, and that Spencer may have drowned trying to bring it back to the dock. But what happened after this is anyone's guess. One of the most popular theories that spread online was that after Spencer drowned, Sophia was left alone at the lighthouse screaming for help. According to this theory, a lone boater may have stopped to offer help and then kidnapped Sophia to either murder her or sell her to traffickers. Dude, what the- This is a likely theory, especially because the chances of another boater going out to the lighthouse so late in the night are pretty slim, but there's no definitive evidence to prove this isn't what uh, happened. 40K maybe another another day. theory that was thrown we'll around on TikTok and Facebook was that Spencer and Sophia had allegedly gotten into an argument at the lighthouse, which led to both of their deaths. However, to me this is even more unlikely than the lone boater theory, as the two appeared to be really good friends and didn't have a history of violence. I mean, if you look at the Snapchat video that was uploaded to Spencer's story just a few minutes before the calls took place, it's pretty clear that they enjoy each other's presence, and something very unexpected would have had to have happened to result in such a tragic accident. As if Wait a minute, Connecticut really has a trafficking problem? Today, the exact cause of Sophia's disappearance is still unknown. Though, the cops and Sophia's family now fully believe that Spencer drowned while trying to bring back the sailboat and Sophia probably didn't want to call 911 out of fear of getting in trouble for trespassing. It's impossible to know if she drowned while trying to rescue her friend, if she fell into the water by accident, or if something else happened to her while she was alone at the lighthouse. I think they probably like try to get to the boat and just drown, man. Nancy Ng in October 2023, a group of 12 Americans traveled to Guatemala for a Be The Change yoga retreat next to the beautiful Lake Adilan, the deepest lake in- Be The Change yoga retreat. You guys do yoga? My heart is good for you. I probably should stretch more, actually. I just lift a new cardio. In Central America. Among those 12 people was 29-year-old Nancy Ng, a California woman who had been to the same retreat the previous year with the same instructor and had enjoyed it so much that she decided to go again in 2023. At around 10.30 a.m. on October 19, 10 people from the group went kayaking in Lake Anilan. Before paddling to the middle of the lake, a video was taken of the entire retreat group, where Nancy could be seen waving at the camera as she paddled a few feet from the shore. She seemed happy as she made her way to join the rest of the group. But sadly, this is footage of the last time Nancy was ever seen. After the video ended, everyone in the group paddled in separate directions with Nancy kayaking toward the middle of the lake along with Christina Blazek, another woman from California. What happens next depends- You notice how both these stories happen by the water? Dude, water is terrifying, man. Water is scary. ...on who you ask, but according to the owners of the kayak rental company, the group came back from the excursion a few minutes later with a lot of them looking pretty nervous and on edge. That's when they noticed the group had one less person. Nancy hadn't come back. Strangely, nobody in the group seemed to want to talk to the owners. As per the owner's testimony, the retreat goers went home as quickly as they could, failing wow. to even pay for the kayaks or provide an explanation as to what happened to Nancy. According to witnesses, Christina Blazek looked visibly shaken and had to be calmed down by the rest of the group as they made their way back home. Holy this shit. is where things start to get a little weird. Even though the group wasn't scheduled to go back to the U.S. for a few more days, they all pushed up their departure and went back home just eight hours after the excursion. According to Eduardo Ramad, the organizer of the Be The Change retreat, the group immediately reported the disappearance to the Guatemalan police. But according to the cops themselves, the group took almost 24 hours to notify them that Nancy had gone missing. Strangely, when Eduardo first notified Nancy's family of the incident, he didn't specify that Nancy had gone missing in the lake. Instead, he tried to get away with vaguely implying that she wasn't coming back, which led Nancy's family to initially believe that she was planning on permanently relocating to Guatemala. Man, you know what's extra scary about this? Is that that woman went there with a bunch of people. So even with a bunch of people, man, she wasn't safe. By that time, the Guatemalan police had already launched a search for Nancy, but after 72 hours, the search was suspended, leaving Nancy's family to fund the rest of the investigation themselves. While all of this... 
Somebody goes missing, and the family has to fund the investigation. This was happening. Nancy's family tried to reach out to Christina Blazek, as she was allegedly the last person who saw Nancy missing. But she refused to talk to the family and took an entire month to give her statement through her lawyer once she- Dude, police don't give a shit, man. ...was back in the U.S. According to Christina, she and Nancy had crossed paths at the deepest part of the lake as they were about to head back to the shore. Out of nowhere, Nancy decided to hop out of the kayak to go for a swim. The water was pretty rough, and Lake Aditlan is over 1,000 feet deep, which is why Christina allegedly cautioned Nancy against going in the water. But based on Christina's statement, Nancy didn't listen to her and jumped off her kayak at the deepest part of the lake, leaving her kayak to float away in the strong current. Sensing that Nancy was about to be in serious trouble, Christina paddled as hard as she could to retrieve the kayak and bring it back to her, but by the time she got back to where her friend was swimming, Nancy was gone. Refusing to put herself in danger to rescue Nancy, who was now submerged under the strong currents of Lake Aditlan, Christina reportedly paddled back to the shore screaming for help, but by the time she made it back, it was too late. Strange. I mean, look, man, I don't know how much of her story is true, but if I was in a situation where somebody jumped in the water when they shouldn't have, I'm not putting myself in danger. Absolutely not. Actually, the Guatemalan police said Christina gave them her statement about the incident and was very forthcoming with them. But when Nancy's family reached out to the Guatemalan authorities, they couldn't find any records of Christina's statement on their files. At this time, allegations started being thrown around that Nancy had never been offered a life jacket before she went on her kayak. But the owners of the kayak rental company went on record to clarify that that was completely false and that the only reason Nancy could be seen without a life jacket in the video was that she decided not to take one. Because Christina refused to talk to the victim's family, they took matters into their own hands and did something that was honestly pretty messed up. They revealed Christina's name publicly and accused her of withholding information from them. As soon as they did that, Christina started receiving death threats from people all over the world. The case garnered a ton of attention on TikTok and Facebook, with dozens of internet sleuths leaking Christina's address and cell phone to threaten her and make her life a living nightmare. As the case gained more and more traction online, some of the wildest things started to get thrown around, with many people alleging that Nancy had been murdered by her retreat group in a cult sacrifice or as a part of an elaborate hate crime on account of Nancy's a Asian cult descent. Sacrifice? What's really strange about this case is how different everyone's testimony is about how the group acted when they realized Nancy was missing. If they had acted a little more transparently, it honestly wouldn't be too hard to believe that everything Christina said was true, but because they acted so- uh, something sus definitely happened, man. Why the f is like 11 people gonna act that way, man? So shady and stayed silent for so long after the incident, it's understandable why everyone on the internet accused them of hiding something. As of today, many witnesses- I think the whole group is hiding something. Still haven't given their statements, and there are even allegations that the group bribed the Guatemalan police to let them leave the country early, but there's no definitive proof that this really happened. My personal opinion is that Christina is probably telling the truth and that the group most likely didn't have anything to do with Nancy's death. I'm not justifying the way they acted, but to a certain extent, it's understandable that they'd be nervous after the incident, considering yeah. that they were in a foreign country where they yep. didn't speak the language and didn't know how the police would react to Christina's version of the events. Still, their suspicious behavior leaves a lot of room for doubt. Hopefully, more information will continue to surface I mean, on Nancy's disappearance, but for- I could also see that too, right? Like, they could literally just be scared. For the time being, this case will have to remain a mystery. Patricia Meehan On April 20th, 1989, a woman named Peggy Bueller drove down a dark country road near a small town in Montana named Circle. Suddenly, she saw a woman driving in her lane on the wrong side of the road, heading straight toward her at a pretty high speed. Peggy swerved and was fortunately able to avoid crashing head-on. Unfortunately, Carol White, the woman in the car behind Peggy, wasn't as fortunate. Carol had witnessed the near miss just seconds earlier and had attempted to swerve out of the way as well, but was struck head-on by the woman driving the wrong way. Shocked from the crash and understandably a little dazed, Carol stepped out of the car and tried to find the woman who had caused the accident. A few seconds later, a blonde woman in her mid-30s crawled out of her wrecked vehicle and stood on the side of the road. According to Carol, the woman didn't say anything. She just stared at her with a blank expression. Shortly after, Peggy Bueller looped back around to make sure everyone was okay after the accident. And that's when she saw the blonde woman climb over a fence running parallel to the highway. What in her witness state, Peggy said, As I looked out across the accident, I noticed someone on the other side of the fence, standing there like a spectator, not like it had happened to her. By the time the cops arrived, the blonde woman was gone. 
but they managed to identify her thanks to her license plates as 38-year-old Patricia Meehan, a resident of Bozeman, Montana, where she worked as a rancher in the summer. For five days, the police combed the area with dogs and helicopters, but found no signs of Patricia, only a series of footprints about a mile away from the crash site that eventually disappeared. According to police reports, Patricia had been on her way to her parents' house in Pittsburgh before the crash. Interestingly, the cops later found that Patricia had spoken to her parents on the day before the crash and had told them that she was under a lot of stress and wanted to move back in with them for a while. Because Patricia was a pretty- I think I've heard about this before, actually. Pretty stable woman and didn't have any problems with alcohol or drugs, her parents were caught off guard at the request, but accepted under the conditions that she see a therapist before moving back in with them. So, before heading to her parents' house, Patricia scheduled an appointment the following day with a specialist and prepared to make the trip to Pittsburgh. It's unknown why she passed through the town of Circle, which isn't exactly on the way to Pittsburgh from Bozeman, but it's possible she may have gotten lost. With no real leads other than Patricia's identity and her family's statements, the cops tried to find a viable explanation as to where she could have gone. After a while, they narrowed it down to two possible theories. Either Patricia had hitched a ride after disappearing into the darkness, or she stowed away on a hay truck that the cops had seen a little more than a mile from the crash site. This is where things get a little strange. Over the next few days, a bunch of people started calling the cops claiming that they had seen Patricia Meehan at different truck stops and diners along I-70, acting dazed and confused and asking strangers for rides. By the end of June that year, more than 25 sightings had been reported to Patricia's parents, who had both traveled to Montana in hopes of finding their missing daughter. Interestingly, a lot of people who claimed to have seen Patricia verified that it was her when her parents showed them pictures and videos of her, but every single one of them had failed to report the missing woman to the actual cops. It was as if she was doing everything to stay one step ahead of the cops and her parents, even in her seemingly confused state. In the fall of that year, more and more sightings and reports of Patricia started surfacing. Dude, this in is so weird. Patricia allegedly hitched a ride from a woman in Victor, Montana, who offered to let her stay with her and her husband for the night. The next day, they dropped her off at a truck stop to bring her closer to some friends she said she was visiting in another part of the state, and by the time the couple realized they had a wanted missing woman on their hands, Patricia was gone. While all of this was happening, Patricia's parents found a roll of undeveloped film in one of her cameras, where they found a pretty haunting self-portrait that was taken shortly before the accident and disappearance. In it, Patricia can be seen staring at the mirror with a vacant expression and a camera between her hands. As far as we know, this was the last time Patricia was ever photographed. As of today, at least 100 people have reported seeing Why the f wouldn't she just go home? Patricia Meehan since her disappearance, but the authorities haven't managed to locate her. With the extremely like bizarre vaguely nature of the case, this, yeah. everyone from the cops to internet sleuths to the general public has been left wondering what on earth could have happened to Patricia. And this has obviously given rise to all kinds of theories to explain her disappearance. According to one of the most popular ones, Patricia may have suffered from amnesia after the crash, which is possible when you consider the state of mind she was in before she made the trip to Pittsburgh. Multiple psychologists have weighed in to explain that a period of intense stress combined with a potential head injury could have resulted in full-on amnesia, which hauntingly could have made Patricia want to travel across the state in a desperate search for her lost memories. This would explain her dazed and confused behavior, but doesn't explain how she managed to elude the authorities after over 100 people across the country allegedly saw her and interacted with her. One of the darker theories is that Patricia caused the accident on the road on purpose to take her own life, which explains why she would take a detour to Circle instead of taking a more direct route to Pittsburgh. Although this is definitely possible considering she was depressed, it begs the question of why she would schedule an appointment with a therapist in Pittsburgh if she was planning on taking her own life just a few hours later. According to other sources, Patricia may never have hitched a ride from anyone and potentially just wandered off into the woods before drowning in a nearby body of water. This would be extremely strange considering that so many people pretty much swore on their lives that they had seen the exact woman in the pictures Patricia's parents showed them. Yeah, I feel like just because she scheduled a therapist, that doesn't mean like too much, right? People can actually be insanely happy and then just the next moment they do that, you know. But stranger things have happened and a couple of detectives have mentioned this is definitely possible. Because the incident happened so long ago, it's unlikely we'll ever know what happened to Patricia Meehan, and this will probably just have to remain one of the strangest, most haunting, unsolved disappearances in history. That's weird, man. It's like, it's like after the crash, she became like an urban legend, because people kept reportingly seeing her, and I mean, I'm not saying that they didn't actually see her, but like, sometimes that type of stuff can get in your head, you know? Kaylin Louder. 
At around 9 p.m. on September 26, 2014, a woman named Kaylin Louder made a panicked 911 call in which she alleged that there was a fight going on inside her condo's clubhouse. When she asked if any weapons had been involved in the fight, she claimed she had heard gunshots. When the cops arrived at the condo, they saw a wedding reception full of happy guests and had trouble believing yeah, what Kaylin had told Crowley's them. Videos. According to the police These report, one really of the guests good. admitted he had previously lit a firecracker, which Kaylin may have mistaken for a gunshot. Very good channel. Strangely, a few hours later, Kaylin once again called 911, but hung up before the dispatcher picked up. <clears throat> a few minutes later, the cops called her back, and they reported that she sounded pretty confused. Although the cops had trouble understanding what she was saying, Kaylin did confess that her roommate thought she was acting delusional and paranoid. A little after 8 a.m. the next morning, she once again called the cops, and this is a call that is most often referred to as one of the most disturbing recorded 911 calls publicly available. I'll play a fragment of the call so you can hear it for yourself. But I've been treated house. Repeat the address for verification. They're stealing from my house. Okay, say your address one more time. I'm having a hard time hearing you. Get the out of my house. Okay, do you know who this person is? No, I don't. I just know that there's an intruder in my house. You don't know who they are? No, I don't. Were weapons involved or mentioned? They're not talking or responding. I'm just telling them to leave so I can hear them taking things. So you haven't seen them? You can just hear them? Yes, correct. During the call, Kaylin tells the dispatcher that there's an intruder in her apartment, but then contradicts herself several times and starts saying a bunch of things that just don't make any sense. At one point during the call, Kaylin's roommate Carol walks in her room and sounds pretty confused at the allegations that someone broke into their apartment. Oh, maybe she's crazy and thought her roommate was the person stealing shit. A few seconds later, Kaylin explains that the previous night she had seen multiple people stalking her through her window and apparently were planning on breaking in. Okay, where exactly are you? I'm in the back bedroom. Carol, where did the suspect door? enter the building? Um, there's only one door. Get out of my is there, house! Is there anyone else in the building who belongs there? Yes, there's six apartments. Okay, is there anybody else in your apartment that should be there? I believe she is here. I have a roommate. Hey! Carol, lock the door! There's, there's something going on there. Come here. Come here. What the f Okay, what's going on now? They've left now? Yeah, so I'm just going to look and see if anything's been taken. Someone opened the door, and I heard them come in. Don't do that, Carol. It's the door still locked. It's not impossible. They, they must have a key or something. Because when I, I took the dog out, I heard people talking. Um, and there were people last night, like, sitting outside the window. And so they, like, is were struggling with that or something. Why is the door still locked? Well, <laughs> I can't explain that. Yeah. But I heard, like, two people talking. Strangely, Carol points out that the door to the apartment is still locked and has been locked all morning, which would obviously make it impossible for someone to break in, but Kaylin still sounds pretty upset and convinced that there was an intruder in the apartment. Even though it was relatively clear from the call that there hadn't been a break-in, the cops still went to Kaylin's residence to make sure she was okay, and once there, they confirmed that there were no signs someone had broken in. Later that day, at around 6 p.m., the condo security cameras captured Kaylin outside of her apartment, walking barefoot in the rain toward a little creek close to the condo entrance. The footage shows her carrying her dog as she walks back to her apartment from the creek. It's unclear if she's talking to herself or to her dog in the footage, but her behavior definitely seems a little bit off. Mm. No, I think she's a few talking seconds to an imaginary she can be seen person. running back to her apartment as if she was running away from someone. What the fuck? Tragically, that video was the last time Kaylin was ever seen alive. 
Later that day, she went missing after leaving her phone, her dog, her shoes, and her wallet at home. During the investigation, her family revealed that she never left her dog Phyllis alone for more than an hour, even taking him along to special events such as weddings and graduations. From the start of the investigation, the cops alleged that Kaylin appeared to be mentally ill. Although police combed the entire area, the initial search for Kaylin was unsuccessful, and it wasn't- If she was, like, mentally ill, you'd think that, like, her friends and family would know. Like, how rare is it that someone has, like, a mental disability or something and people, like, don't know? Or does that just happen? Do people, like, just lose their mind one day after being insane and then- I just feel like that if it was, like, schizophrenia or some shit, it could definitely just happen. That's crazy until two and a half months later on December 1st of that year. I mean, year, I guess that's true too, right? Like, maybe her family didn't care about her or anything. Maybe they just didn't give a shit. ...that her body was discovered by West Valley City work crews looking at a drainage pipe. Disturbingly, the work crew noticed her body sticking out of the water in the middle of the river, partially hidden by plants. But because her body had been decomposing in the water for so long, it took the cops a while to determine her age and gender. And even when they confirmed her identity, it was impossible for them to determine the cause of death, which added another layer of mystery to the case. From the moment the body was discovered, Kaylin's family claimed that foul play had been involved, but this was impossible to confirm due to the level of decomposition in Wait, her body. Wait, what? Play had to the case. From the moment the body was discovered, Kaylin's family claimed that foul play had been involved. Oh, Kaitlyn's family, so not the cops. Okay. Involved, but this was impossible to confirm due to the level of decomposition in her body. What's strange about this case is that her body was found pretty far away from where the authorities speculated she had accidentally fallen into the creek and drowned. The river she allegedly fell into is pretty shallow, and even with the heavy rain, it seems unlikely that her body could have been carried all the way to where it was found without getting snagged on a branch or stuck in the mud. Even though the authorities chalked up the whole thing to an accidental drowning that stemmed from what they assumed to be a psychotic break, there are a lot of details in the case that simply don't add up. For starters, Kaylin didn't really have a history of mental illness. Although she was finding it hard to find a job and had allegedly been a little down for a few months according to her father's testimony, pretty much everyone else in her life had described her as stable and relatively happy. However, earlier in 2014, Kaylin had gotten a job at a school but was let go a few months later, which according to her dad made her a little depressed. In the weeks leading up to her disappearance, she had been rejected from another job opportunity, which probably didn't do wonders for her emotional state. I was able to find that there had been some events in Kaylin's past that may have contributed to her deteriorating mental state. Three years after she graduated from college in 2006, her twin brother accidentally murdered their uncle while they were both under the influence of drugs for- What the f- Accidentally murdered their uncle? Which he was six, her twin brother accidentally murdered their uncle while they were both under the influence of drugs for which he was sentenced to five years in prison. Even though the incident obviously shook her up, she remained pretty stable and never showed signs of her mental health deteriorating, at least not to the point where it would seem normal for her to suddenly start making disturbing 911 calls where she appeared to be delusional. From what I found, there are two main theories to explain what happened to Kaylin. The first theory is that Kaylin suffered from a sudden psychotic break due to all the stress she was under from not being able to find a job. The investigators who proposed this theory claimed that Kaylin probably walked barefoot in the rain until she was so tired that she fell into the river. This is definitely a possibility, but one thing that stands out to me about this theory is that nobody reported seeing Kaylin walking around on the street on the day of her disappearance. Yeah, that's like different, like manslaughter is like different than like first degree murder, second degree murder, all that shit. Appearance. The second theory is that even if Kaylin was a little paranoid, she wasn't wrong about someone wanting to harm her. And if she truly was being stalked by someone on the night before she called 911 to report the supposed gunfight, they may have gotten to her before the cops could intervene. Still, based on her roommate's testimony, it's possible that Kaylin was really just imagining the whole thing due to her worsening mental state, but we'll likely never know. Man, that's The case just left thousands of big unanswered questions. That story's crazy. For starters, who was Kaylin really talking to in the surveillance video? This doesn't look like she's talking to her dog, man. This looks like that she sees a person right here. At least to me, because look at the angle she's facing, right? Her dog's over there. I don't know, that's just what it looks like to me. Was it just her dog? Was she talking to herself? Or was she talking to someone else? Why was she walking barefoot in the rain in the first place? And if she was paranoid and delusional, what could have triggered her mental breakdown? With over 10 years having gone by since the incident, it's very likely that whatever happened to Kaylin Lauder on the evening of September 26, 2014 will remain a mystery. Damn, that's crazy.
Like the story itself is crazy. And then when he looked into her past and found out her twin or whatever mur accidentally murdered their uncle, dude, that was even more crazy. Dale Kerstetter. On September 12th, 1987, a 50-year-old security guard and maintenance man named Dale Kerstetter went to work as he usually did at the Corning Glass Works plant in Bradford, Pennsylvania. At 11 p.m., he began his night shift as a weekend security guard. The next morning, at around 7 a.m., the day shift security guard named John Lindquist came to relieve Dale from his shift, but he was nowhere to be found. John immediately went to the cafeteria to see if Dale was there, but the only thing he found was Dale's lunchbox with his food still inside. Mm. Strangely, a few minutes later, Dale's truck was found in the parking lot of the plant with his keys, a pack of cigarettes, his backpack, and an empty pistol holster still inside the truck. Holy shit. Sensing something was wrong, the cops brought search dogs to the plant to find Dale. A few minutes later, the dogs traced Dale's scent to the second floor, where the plant's glass furnace was located, along with some pretty valuable platinum pipes. This was pretty strange considering that Dale rarely went to that part of the building and had no business going near the pipes. That's when the plant manager decided to check the security footage from the night before, and what he found was pretty disturbing. The footage you're seeing now is the original footage of the incident, which is now extremely grainy due to the slow deterioration process of the old footage, and it's pretty much Jesus. useless for the purposes of this video. Bro, there's no way there's not a ghost in here. Look. Did you see it? There's there's definitely a ghost in here somewhere. We just needed to we just needed to have a red circle. The video you're about to see is a reenactment of the footage, which is supposed to be perfectly accurate as per my research. Okay. In the footage, the manager saw a masked man walking around the plan, apparently scouting the building. Shortly after, the man ran up to the second floor of the plant where the highly valuable platinum pipes were located. A few seconds after this, Dale can be seen speaking I mean, to I mean, I believe this. You know people still like copper pipes or something? Because the shit sells? Yeah, people still shit like this all the time. Masked man while he appears to be coerced out of the room. And as the masked man drags wiring, him out of the room by sorry, the arm, yeah, yeah, Dale sorry, looks wiring. straight at the security camera. Shit, yeah, maybe maybe he shot him, dude. At one point in the footage, the masked man can be seen dragging a heavy bag out of the building with a manual forklift. That night, a quarter of a million dollars worth of platinum pipes were stolen from the plant, and Dale Kerstenner was never two hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of pipes, bro. That shit sells, man. Seen million dollars worth of platinum pipes were stolen from the plant, and Dale Kerstenner was never seen or heard from again. Yeah. In the aftermath of the mysterious disappearance, several theories were brought up to explain whether Dale was an innocent victim or an inside man in the high stakes robbery. According to Dale's family, it would have been extremely unlike him to participate in a crime like this because he just wasn't that type of guy. He was described as an honest, loyal, family-loving, and fun-loving man who just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. It's possible that Dale might have spotted the masked man at some point during his shift, and when he went to investigate, the man may have coerced him into cooperating and then murdered him. If this theory I think is to that's be believed, more likely. then the bag that the man was hauling out of the building with a forklift could have contained Dale's body along with the platinum pipes. But other employees at the plant seem to have a completely different opinion based on their experience of Dale. Oh. For starters, whoever removed the platinum from the tank was very familiar with the layout of the plant. Okay. They knew exactly where the most valuable materials in the plant were, as well as all the tools they would need to extract the platinum pipes from the tank and quickly exit the tank area. Even though Dale had never stolen anything and was generally a good person, he had gotten into trouble several times with his employers for being a slow worker and having a bad attitude. In the investigation, I mean, it was also revealed that Dale was around $40,000 in debt after being demoted from okay. his job as a trade worker at the plant, okay. which meant he not only needed money at the time of the robbery, but wasn't at all happy with his employers after he was forced to take a $7,000 pay cut. Oof. This led some people to believe Holy that he may shit. have been in on the crime, which would explain how the masked man knew his way around the plant so well. Still, his family claims he would have had several other legal ways of obtaining the money before resorting to a high-stakes, premeditated robbery and disappearance without a trace. One of the things that makes the disappearance so- It still doesn't explain the fact that, like, he completely disappeared, right? ...so ambiguous is Dale's behavior in the security camera footage. 
For starters, it's hard to tell if he was truly being forced to walk out of the room with the man, or if he was just pretending to be coerced. And when he looks up at the camera, it's really anyone's guess if he was silently begging for help, or if he was performing a sort of gesture of defiance toward his former employers. To this day, it's unknown if Dale was murdered after being the unwilling witness of a crime, or if he was an inside man who left his entire family behind for money. Damn. Yo, that was good. Yo, that was good.